through the window over to the ones that went left. And right. Yeah, there's the usual disclaimer. The forward-looking statements in that one. Yeah, the forward-looking statements. <laughs> Um, I come and talk to you about the uh, Stockton project, which is a rebadged Penambra mine, which was mined in the mid 90s. Uh, base metals deposit, the only base metals deposit uh, in Victoria. We're located in far northeast, northeast, just near the border, uh, in a Silurian Age <coughs> rift basin, which is one of a number of Silurian sedimentary basins in the Block and Thulgar, <coughs> which host uh, VMS deposits. Oh, sorry. The largest of which is is Woodlawn up in here. In fact, apart from Woodlawn and Stockman, are the only economic ones uh, in the Lock and Fall Belt. So we've got two deposits, the Karawang deposit and the Wilga deposit. Uh, they're discovered in the mid-70s, mid-late 70s by Western Mining. They have current resources of about 12 and a half million tonnes at just over, I don't know what's happened to the text, that says 2% copper, 4% uh, zinc, 30 gram, 38 grams silver, Plus is about 0.7% lead and about 1.1 grams gold. Um, so all up, it's about 260,000 tonnes of copper. And copper is the, real, the metal that's driving the economics of the project. Um, they're both deposits open down plunge, and I'll go through that in a, in a minute. Right, regional geology. Um, the deposits sit within the limestone creek graben, the youngest of which, the oldest sediments of which are the, uh, the Blueys Creek formation shown here in green. Uh, there are sort of fine-grained sediments and, and felsic and intermediate volcanics. These are overlain unconformly by a thick package of uh, coarse sandstones. This is a minor felsic volcanics. They're, they're overlain unconformly by this huge, big, thick package of subaqueous rhyolites and, and felsic intrusives. And then they're overlain by a, a thin, in places thin, but in some places quite thick siltstone package, which has got some minor limestone things and um, bits and par parts in as well. And then <coughs> over that is the Gibson Folly Formation, which is the, a package of siltstone, um, minor mudstone, felsics, and intermediate and uh, mafic volcanics. And this is the uh, unit that hosts mineralisation. So they range in age from the uh, upper Ordovician down in the Blue's Creek Formation to the uh, upper Silurian. And there, this over here is the major fault, it goes up here called the Indy Fault, uh, and these rocks here are the homeomanamorphics, which are Ordovician age sediments that are strongly deformed, um, same age as these rocks down here, but these are underformed. So the basin, sedimentary basin is bound to the south by this structure here, and to the north by that one. So the structure, the, as I said, it's a late Ordovician early Silurian age, it's the formation of the limestone creek graben. Uh, in the early Devonian, you had the closing up of the, and the deformation of that graben with north, northwest over southeast thrusting. There's three main phases of deformation identified. These are based on work by uh, Rod Allen, who did his PhD uh, on it, and he did that in 1987, and pretty much it stands up today. No one's uh, managed to find much fault with it. So he put this D1 and T2 deformation as really the same event, just a progression from this bedding parallel cleavage to his, this. Uh, north dipping inclined folds with associated thrust folding. And this is the major effect we see. The rocks are really strongly deformed. And this is what we see as the most um, pervasive fabric. There's also this, this D3 structure, which is northwest um, to northeast striking brittle faults. This is much la later day than these two. These are only affect the uh, Silurian rocks. These affect the uh, overlying Devonian uh, long, um, snow river volcanics. So that's what it looks like, the, the faults. So these things here are the, are the these big things here, the big D3, uh, big D2 structures, heaps of them. And you see these ones here are the, the D3 uh, features. So obviously being a VMS deposit, it's going to have a, uh, a uh, EM response. This is an EM we flew in 2008 over our entire tenement package. Karawong and Wilga stand up. Um, like the proverbial, not a lot else around, as you can see. It's really noisy data. All these lines here are the flight line directions and they had major problems with levelling due to the terrain. So going from here, from, or for example, from here to about here is about um, 200 metres elevation difference. So the helicopter had huge problems maintaining constant flying height. So trying to maintain, to get that level was a real possibility. 
but that's all we can work with. I guess what it does show is that there's uh, nothing near surface uh, that is anything like Wilgren Coral, but you need to remember that Coral and Wilgren within 80 metres of surface and parallel, sub parallel to the slope of the terrain. If you put these things um, on a, under 200 to 300 metres underground, uh, you're probably unlikely to see them. Creates a few challenges for us, obviously. Magnetic, uh, magnetic response, mostly related to geology, but Carl Wong and Wilga both have very subtle responses. They're just in there, it's a bit, very hard to see. But in detail, when you look, when you zoom in, um, especially Wilga, it stands out as quite a little blip um, that is directly related to mineralisation. These features here of tertiary dikes. Okay, Karawang deposit, <coughs> excuse me, hosted by a sedimentary package uh, with dacites and minor basalts. So this is a, these are all stones and mudstones. The brown unit here, a dacite, um, and green is basalt. We don't really see too much basalt at, at um, Karawang. This orange coloured here is the silica sericite pyrite alteration we see in football, extensively in the football of the um, mineralisation. You can see there's five separate lenses. Um, if you're wondering why they've got A, B, then you jump to J, K and M, there was originally a number of lenses, these are all historical ones, um, and they did have A through, right through to M and then they, the more they drilled, the more they coalesced and end up with A, B, J, K and M. Um, this is a, an old section, so you can see these structures here, this, this is where the historical structure in turn was. We came in and thought that was a fairly unlikely um, sort of architecture to have. We, Thought we much more likely to be a duplex system, um, but we really didn't have a lot of evidence for it. The DPI and the wisdom for those of you who don't know, um, this project was mined, and then 2003 fires came through and burnt the project out. Um, so it was in the, in the uh, downturn. DPI decided to get all the core and throw it in the tailings dam. 374 diamond holes were chucked away. So we had absolutely no geological evidence. We had no core to go and look at. Um, so we pretty well have to start again. Uh, the other unit down here is, a, is this yellow one, which is a, a quartz porphyry intrusive. Um, we think it's later, but we don't actually have any evidence to show, to show that. Everywhere we see it, we see a, a, a sheared margin to it. So I'm just going to show the next one of, <coughs> of why, well, I guess, backs up our interpret the duplex structures. So this is a, a leapfrog model. <coughs> Excuse me of the copper mineralisation. So all we've done here is just get all the copper, all the raw copper data, throw it into leapfrog um, and let the let it model it. You can see there's some unusual shapes in here. So these are these are five lenses, there's the M lens right up through to A. These could be these are interpreted stru structures that we could put on easily explained by duplex structures. Unfortunately it's, you can't just go to the core and say there's a there's a shear zone and hold it. <coughs> It is just so massively destroyed. It's really the only way you can tell you're in a shear zone is an increased level of intensity of shearing. And I think that in, in reality, when we start mining this thing, we're going to find that there's multiple ones in here. You can even see evidence suggesting another one coming through there, probably another one coming through there. So it worked very well in the copper. We thought that's that's great. Do we see anything else? So there's the zinc. Again, you can see the same thing. So we're fairly confident that we've got this um, this duplex system. And that's explaining why um, we're getting five lenses. Historically, there's been um, people suggesting there's been one lens right through to five separate lenses. Our interpretation that it was all one lens originally, and it's been cut up by this duplexing. Wilga <coughs> deposit, in contrast, is much simpler. So red's the ore zone. <coughs> Again, it's hosted predominantly in the uh, siltstone mudstone packages with, with dacite intrusive dacite related to it. We think the dacite actually acts as an aquitard so that when we see dacite we don't, tend not to see mineralisation. We see mineralisation in fact well, essentially stopping against dacite in some places. Uh, but there's a big football, um, hanging wall basalt at, uh, at Wilga which we don't see at Coral. And the other main difference is this uh, structure here which has been logged as a, a myelinite, it's not the myelinite, it's just really a, it's just a shear zone but that puts that in direct um, contact with the Thorkadam volcanics which are much older. Don't see uh, any mineralisation, uh, any alteration in the football of this because of this shear zone. So you can, see, but you do see alteration in the hangle and the long strike. Those black squares, shapes there, are the mining of uh, Wilga. 
which was done in 92 to 96, and they pulled out about a million tonnes at around about 6% copper, so they absolutely picked the eyes out of it. But I guess you've got to remember copper in those days was about $1,000 a tonne, um, so compared to now it's $9,000 a tonne. It'd be fantastic if we still had that there. Okay, so I'm just going to put, talk about the regional geology and some of the prospects that we've got. Um, this is overlaying uh, VTEM with the, the geology. It's a bit like um, Luke was saying earlier, it looked a bit better on my screen than it does up here. Um, but this is the Gibson Folly Formation here, which is host immunisation. You can see the Coalong um, VTEM response and the, the Wilga one. This package of rocks here is the Thilkadan Volcanics, and this is the Bluey Creek Formation down here. There's a number of prospects. I obviously can't talk about all in the time we've got. So I'm just going to talk about uh, what we've still got left at Karawong and, and Wilga, why we think we've got a bit more there. I'll talk a bit about the Bigfoot prospect and the Wilga South prospect and the peppermint, and I'll briefly touch on banks here. So you can see most of the prospects we've got are, are in that Gibson's Folly Formation, but the Wilga South and peppermint are in Thorkadan Volcanics, and banks here is in uh, Lewis Creek Formation. So this is the V10 blown up. This blue shape here is the outline of the ore. Uh, you can see there's a the V10 anomaly is much larger than the ore body that we know today at Karawong. We don't really know why that is. We've drilled a couple of holes in here and all we do is hit that Karawong porphyry. So we haven't really explained why um, this is here. And again you can see a little bit out here that Wilga's still open um, to the north. Uh, the other thing I guess our work identified is there was a really strong plunge control mineralisation in this direction which wasn't really picked up in historical work, um, which means it's plunging down here, there's a, a massive big hill over here, so potentially mineralisation could actually extend further than the V-term anomaly suggests. Um, this here is what we call our box anomaly, it's under the old plant site. Um, lots of alteration, we've drilled a few holes into lots of alteration but we've got nothing to explain that, um, that V-term either. So that's uh, sort of scratching your heads a bit. So Wilga South, uh, it's located within 500 metres of Wilga. You can see this is Wilga out here. These are the drill hole traces with the red lines of the copper grades, copper histograms, 50 metres squares. So we're talking, um, sorry, I think, no, they're 100 metres squares. So it's wide space drilling. Um, significantly uh, anomalous, well, it's not, not anomalous, they're economic copper grades. At, this is stuff we can do. Uh, heavy metre separation, which means anything about 0.8% copper becomes economic, especially at this close. Um, so we've got a huge area here, sort of about three or 400 metre strike length. It's open in every direction, um, and we're just starting to drill that now. Um, this is the cross-section through Wilga, based purely on the um, Western Mining Historical Drilling and <coughs> mapping. Um, it's, to say it's complicated is a bit of an understatement. You're, Basically, to explain this geometry, you, you have to invoke an early F1 thrust, which has been folded, and then that's been reactivated and had additional thrusting back along that. And these things in here are the mineralisation. Western Mining interpreted to be a, the stringer zone to uh, Wilga, um, but that kind of means you have to go across lots of it, deformation events. Um, and Western Mining didn't think that string mineralisation was economic, so they never followed it up. Bigfoot, okay, it's located very close to Karong. Um, historical hulls of similar results to those in the margins of Emlens. So on the Emlens, which is um, down here, we tend to see high grade uh, lead and gold. Um, this shape here is, is the Emlens ore body, which is about 6 million tonnes. If you picked up that six million times outline and put up here, you can see there's three holes that have intercepted it on the edge and one in the middle. Um, we're seeing sort of 5.2 metres of 2% lead and 4 grams gold um, and 14% zinc and 11.5 <coughs> grams gold. These are definitely economic, even at those widths, um, especially um, here, because we'd be able to get our decline winds would come in about here, so they're very close to the, to the uh, workings. So, easily mindable, we don't need six million tonnes for it to be economic, we only need sort of several hundred thousand tonnes, so we, we need a target sort of about this size, um, so it's an excellent target. We've drilled a few holes down here, that hasn't come up with much, um, we've seen lots of alteration, we've just got some, do some downhole EM now, and that's where to go next. Peppermint, 
This is uh, located it's about 2k south of, of Karawong. It's in the Thilkadan Volcanics, so it's a completely different set of rocks from Karawong and Wilga. Very large lead, uh, lead geochem anomaly shown out by this pink um, outline here. Um, it's a potentially different style of, of mineralisation. There's some goss in here which attracted Western mining here. In fact, the very first drill hole and project was drilled into it. Um, but having no drilling since 1984, and the deepest hole is, uh, sorry, there's only three holes greater than 50 metres deep. All these green ones here are uh, 16 metres deep. So they effectively haven't tested it at all. Um, and again, they were looking for VMS deposits. They were very model driven, so if it wasn't a VMS deposit, they walked away from it. And there's um, examples of, of some prospects they had up in the, what is now National Park where they got 2% zinc in soils and didn't have a, a, a EM anomaly so they didn't drill it because they said it wasn't uh, a VMS deposit. It's also got this big arsenic anomaly. They didn't analyse the gold in their geochem, um, but arsenic is a very good proxy for gold at Karawong. Um, and so that's a, we think that's an that's interesting gold target. And you can see it's associated with this, um, this unit here, which is a, a rhyolitic plug. So again, interesting target for us. So the best result in the drilling of at Peppermint is 3.2 metres at 1.7% lead and 3.5% zinc. So they're sort of sub-economic grades, um, very encouraging. The last one I'll talk about is Banksy. I don't have any um, nice pictures and things of Banksy, mainly because it's uh, an area that's extremely rugged. <coughs> it's about 6 k's as the crow flies from the operations or the mine, the other deposits, but it's about probably 15 to 20 k's by drop road. It's to access it, you have to go through National Park and they lock the gates for six months a year. So we kind of haven't <coughs> paid too much attention to it. But we're getting very interesting grades. Uh, 3.6 metres, 2% copper um, and high silver. These are indicative of, of stringer mineralisation that we would see at, um, at Carroll and Wilga. So very encouraging. But this next picture will show you why we haven't gone down there very much. Banksy sits down in that valley. Um, down in there, and our biggest challenge, apart from um, dealing with various government departments, is just how you access this ground. Um, we put in a drill pad to drill Wilga South, it cost us something in the order of $150,000 to put a track in. So, and um, that's 500 metres from a known ore body. So, to venture down into here, um, we have to have a different strategy. and. The obvious answer is to go to helicopter, but the problem with helicopters in this area is you can only do it in summer. Um, you can't fly for large parts of the time because of the air, we're so high. So where this bloke's standing here at about 1,300 metres. So in summer it can sometimes get you hot to fly the chopper. So we've got a few issues, um, and that's really why we haven't looked at banks in the past. But we will do in the future. And that's it. Thank you. Sorry, that was looking south. So, the Amber Lake in the background, isn't it? No, that's, that's Bindai Station down the back. Oh. So we're looking back, for those who are familiar with the area, we're looking back towards Swiss Creek. Um, down there, Amio sort of sits over in this direction.